thank you for the introduction, and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to, to speak on this subject. This, this is joint work with Professor Fan Zong Hyo from the University of Limoges, uh, and we'd both like to thank uh, the, this uh, group of people, this list of people, for uh, valuable insights and information on this topic. But I also want to say that I'll, in this talk, I'll be expressing some opinions uh, that are entirely my responsibility. Neither any opinions I say or any errors I might make are the responsibility of anybody named on this slide. OK, now, uh, I, the first question is why speak on this topic at AsiaCrypt? It's quite unusual to have an invited talk at an IACR conference on a historical subject. So that's the first question I want to answer. I'll give several reasons. Now, modern cryptography has been US dominated. Uh, and uh, it's very common, especially in the developing world, to simply follow the United States and import cryptography from the US. And uh, there's a lot of reason to think this is really unfortunate. Uh, most obviously, the Edward Snowden revelations show the danger in, in in trusting everything that comes from the United States. And, and I, I think on, uh, on the positive side, his rev these revelations show the, uh, the importance and the value in developing independent expertise in independent commercial products in other parts of the world. So for that reason, it's useful to be aware of strong cryptographic traditions that I exist in other parts of the world. I think you could say that knowing about these traditions can give other countries, in, in this region in particular, the self-confidence needed to break free of US domination in cryptography. That's one reason. Th there's another reason not to rely on the United States for anything. Uh, starting next month, look who will be running the US government. <laughs> OK. Uh, so. Uh, a second reason is that there are valuable lessons from history. Uh, for example, the, important of the importance of the human element and the importance of details of implementation, as, as we heard from uh, Nadia's invited talk on, on Monday, uh, went into a lot of detail about this. Uh, historically, of course, there's from World War II, there's the example of the Enigma machine, who d whose design was actually quite good, but uh, because of poor implementation and the human element, it led to disaster for the Germans. Another valuable lesson of history is the importance of avoiding arrogance and overconfidence. And so, uh, and, and I think that's especially necessary in our era where there's so much self-promotion and hype and we're under pressure to get grants and under pressure to publish a whole lot of papers. And I think uh, often scientific research communities, including the cryptographic research uh, community uh, forget uh, the lesson of history and need to be reminded of the need for humility. Third, uh, a, basic, a third reason to study this is that a basic theme in modern cryptography, especially in the work of pioneers of public key cryptography, such as uh, Whit Diffie and David Shom, and also uh, John Gilmore of the Electronic Frontiers Foundation and Phil Zimmerman of, of Pretty Good Privacy, uh, a, a big motive for them is the idea that cryptography can defend the ordinary person, the little guy, against powerful government agencies and giant corporations. So uh, here, uh, this is a sort of optimistic viewpoint about cryptography, that it can be like in the biblical story of David and Goliath. It can be like the, sh the slingshot that um, David used to bring down the giant Goliath. And it's particularly relevant uh, when we meet here in Vietnam because in the 20th century, probably the best example of a David and Goliath uh, situation was the Vietnamese victory over uh, France in 1954 and over the United States in 1975. In her memoir, uh, Nguyen Thi Binh, uh, perhaps the most famous living woman in, in Vietnam right now, um, she 
was foreign minister of the provisional revolutionary government of South Vietnam and was the lead uh, negotiator of the uh, liberation forces in the South at the Paris peace talks. Uh, and in her memoirs that recently appeared, she, 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 she refers to the story of David and Goliath and says that our friends admired the determination and sacrifice coming from a small nation standing up against a colossal empire. And then she compares our narrative to the biblical story of David and Goliath. OK, so let me start with the French War. Now, at first, uh, in the early years, Vietnamese crypto was very primitive. Uh, it was not even up to normal visionaire uh, ciphers, it was sort of weakened version the, of them. Uh, but there was a lot of effort in the late 1940s to increase cryptographic knowledge uh, in, among the Viet Minh. The Viet Minh were the, was the national front fighting against uh, French colonialism. There was a, a book that had appeared in Paris a decade earlier that uh, was studied extensively by the Viet Minh in the late 1940s. And they put out their own, uh, their own training manual on cryptography, Mat Ma Dai Kong, that was uh, basically fundamentals of cryptography. Uh, oh, for Vietnamese people, please, uh, I apologize for my terrible pronunciation of Vietnamese names and words. I'm sorry about that. I've been visiting Vietnam since 1978, but I still have terrible pronunciation of Vietnamese. Uh, that book is on display in the Ban Co Yo Cryptographic Museum in Hanoi. Ban Co Yo is the name of the uh, Vietnamese government cryptographic agency, the analog of the NSA here. And they have a museum which displays this book. Now, one thing that uh, was in to the advantage of the Viet Minh is that French crypto in Vietnam in those years was also very primitive. It was also uh, not very strong versions of Visionaire. That's kind of funny because, of course, uh, Visionaire himself was a Frenchman and, he, and did very good work for his time, but that was 400 years earlier. So one has to wonder why hadn't, didn't the French come up with something better to use on the battlefield in 400 years? So that's the first interesting question. Uh, one possible reason is that in those years, Vietnam was very remote, very far from Paris in every conceivable sense. Uh, and the forces, the, the, the French who came, to, came here to fight against the independence movement were not the greatest intellects that France possessed. Uh, there's also human resistance to using good crypto, in part uh, well, in part laziness, of course, but in part also because it was so slow. Uh, and uh, we see, um, here's an example that my, my co-author, Hugh, uh, found in the uh, Paris military archives where he uncovered quite a bit of interesting documentation that at the end of 1953, still during the, the war there, uh, the French military conducted a comparison of the time needed to encrypt a sample message using six variants of, of Visionaire that they were considering. And the time ranged from 17 to 44 minutes. So they recommended using the shortest of the six variants. And notice that the recommendation was based on speed, not security. Uh, so Viet Minh and French crypto were at roughly the same level at this time especially in the early years of the French War. Uh, many secrets were captured and, and, and read. Now, at later stages, there were efforts to improve their security, and at least the, the most high priority secret messages were usually sent securely, although uh, many others were not. A leading expert on the French War, uh, Professor Christopher Gostia in Montreal, um, uh, who, who, who was a good source of information for us, uh, comments in his work that the Viet Minh was the only anti-colonial guerrilla force in the 20th century that had high-level communications and intelligence, and that includes crypto, uh, in the sense that maybe not, not high-level from, uh, from our standpoint today, but at the time it matched and often exceeded those of the colonial powers forces. So that, for example, in Algeria, 
the liberation forces did not, could not compete with the French, but here they could. However, in the middle years of the war, around 1950, uh, even though there was a growing knowledge of crypto among the Viet Minh cryptographers at the center, at the central command, this was not always successfully transmitted to people in the field. Uh, I went to, uh, last year, I, I went to visit the Hanoi Police Museum, which had a very interesting exhibit. The, the police museum uh, includes material that in the West we would not think of as belonging in a police museum, such as information about the uh, liberation struggle against the French. And one of the exhibits shows an action of Viet Minh commandos that in September 1950 destroyed the French ship Amiot d'Anville, uh, which, and that thwarted a major French attack on the Thai Nga Gaon Ha Tin liberated zone of central Vietnam. So, so they were able to effectively defend the Viet Minh controlled, those three provinces that were largely Viet Minh controlled at that time they could defend that against, uh, against this attack. Uh, now, the, the exhibit showed the cryptography they used, the actual instructions on cryptography, and I examined that for a few minutes and then thought, oh no, you know, this is, this is terrible. So, so here, let me show you. Uh, it's not easy to read, but um, let me tell you. Uh, the first column has the Vietnamese alphabet, which is a modified Latin alphabet. Then at the very top, you might or might not be able to read the, the, the keyword, the visionaire keyword is Tinha, T-I-N-H-A, and then the five columns, label one through five, show the shifted alphabet using the, those uh, letters. And then on the right, you have a sample message, uh, 17 letters, the, the Vietnamese words run together, run to 17 letters, padded with O-O-O, so you have four plain text on the on the bottom left here, and then the corresponding ciphertext over there on the right, the four uh, five-letter blocks. So it, it, this is just like when I teach elementary crypto, this is what, what we do. Um, okay, and then, so, so this is what it's described there, and then the next slide will show the, the next sheet of instructions that, um, that show the resulting ciphertext highlighted in a rectangular box. The first block of, ci of transmitted ciphertext is the keyword. <laughs> so, okay, okay, so, oops. Uh, well, uh, and, and it's nicely spaced, so you can easily see the keyword length. Um, so, well, it, it, at least they didn't have a problem of key distribution. So. <laughs> Okay, but okay, so we're laughing at, of course, there's reason to laugh at this blatant neglect of Kirchhoff's principle or any other principle of cryptography, but the fact remains that their attack on the French was one of the great successes of a, of a secret guerrilla commando cell in the mid-20th century. So what's the explanation? Why didn't their poor use of cryptography lead to discovery and defeat? So one possibility is that the French never captured any of their communications, so they didn't really need cryptography at all. You could have just sent the plain text. Or maybe the French did capture something, but they're so ignorant, the, the French who captured were so ignorant, they didn't know what they were looking at, and they couldn't crack a visionaire cipher even when given the key. In any case, I think it's clear that we can't conclude from the level of cryptography used in the field at that time by the Vietnamese commandos and the local French uh, we can't conclude much about the, the level of, of cryptographic knowledge at the command centers because they were so isolated there. And, and uh, it might have been that the problem was that the knowledge of cryptography at the command centers was not uh, disseminated to the field. In 1990, the Vietnamese government wrote uh, a long report on the history of cryptography uh, it was sort of leaked to the West. I don't think it was officially declassified in Vietnam, but it was leaked. And the NSA translated it with the title Essential Matters. I bought it in ebook form on Amazon, which was a mistake because NSA, with all of its technological brilliance, does not know how to format an ebook. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it's virtually unreadable, the formatting so bad. I've never seen an ebook that's that bad. 
but there, there, there were some interesting things in it. Uh, not technical details about the cryptography they used, but more the, the people who were involved in the institutions and the importance that the leadership attached to cryptography. So a couple interesting facts uh, that come out of this book. Uh, one is that the cryptographic branch of the People's Armed Forces of Vietnam was formed 10 days exactly after the Declaration of Independence by Ho Chi Minh. It was a top priority. Another thing, in the late 1950, in late 1950 the year 1950, just a little bit after that um, incident with the uh, blowing up the, the Amyot Danville ship, uh, the Vietnamese sent their cryptographers to China for six months of training. And this greatly improved their technical level, according to this report. Now, at this time in 1950, the Chinese experience was a great model, a great inspiration for the Vietnamese. And just a year before, the Chinese communists had defeated a Western-supported regime in uh, an incredible uh, guerrilla war. So it was a major event in this part of the world, obviously. And, uh, but there were differences in communication because in the case of Chinese, the, the, the words first have to be either translated or transliterated somehow to a standard alphabetic language before encryption, where Vietnamese is written in a modified Latin alphabet, as we saw on that earlier slide. And so it can be encrypted directly, but not um, exactly the same way that some modifications were needed. And this was something that the NSA uh, dealt with. There's a declassified uh, report from the NSA called Vietnam, a SIGINT Paradox that explains the, the, this question of the Vietnamese alphabet. They point out that Vietnamese cannot be transmitted by using standard international Morse code because of the peculiar letters and use of accent marks. So the NSA uh, cryptolinguist had to learn uh, what the Vietnamese had done to express the features of their alphabet in Morse code before uh, tackling translation. And they gave the example that the uh, hooked O was rendered as OW before uh, put into Morse code, and the hooked U was translated into UW. And that the, the letter W does not exist in the Vietnamese alphabet, so it could be used for a special purpose. And NSA report went on to say that because the, the U-hook, O-hook combination occurs very often in Vietnamese, for example, my co-author's name, and a lot of other names. Um, it's very common, so they would abbreviate U-W-O-W to simply wow. So that, there was, so that was the, uh, the, the first step before uh, rendering it into Morse code and then, and then encrypting it. Um, but that's the closest that the NSA report comes to anything uh, technical. And I should say that the NSA declassified histories have been very useful to us, but uh, th th they talk about other things besides technical details related to cryptography. So for sometimes they're very useful for determining context, but not really for um, technical things. Another interesting thing that NSA report is that they conclude that as early as 1961, which was the very beginning of the American War, NSA analysts knew that our opponents were good at the cryptologic trade and maintained a healthy respect for the cryptologic abilities of the North Vietnamese. Well, in the 1950s, the main foreign help uh, came, came from China until the late 1950s when the Soviet Union replaced China as a source of advice and assistance. Uh, but I don't want to minimize the, the role of China as a source of, uh, uh, of, of help in other areas. China continued to assist Vietnam in other areas, especially in air defense. And one thing that I didn't know about before doing research on this topic was that according to US intelligence estimates that in the air war, between 1965 and 1973, over 5,000 Chinese advisors were either killed or wounded by the U.S. Air Force. Um, this is pretty incredible. Uh, this was a really a horrible time for Vietnam because of these air attacks. And in fact, there's a famous statement by the U.S. Air Force General Curtis LeMay said that he wanted to bomb the Vietnamese back into the Stone Age. And uh, in this, uh, so it, it, it was 
there were some, quite a few Chinese advisors who were among the victims of this. Uh, let, let me just make a, a brief statement here about this, because as I say, I didn't know about this earlier. Um, it seems that perhaps the history of the period that I'm talking about, the period of the French and American Wars, when uh, Vietnam and China were close allies, uh, gives reason to hope that despite actions by China in later years, it will be possible to find uh, a peaceful diplomatic solution to regional tensions and restore relations of friendship and cooperation between those two neighboring countries. At least that's a fervent hope that I have. Okay, so back to the crypto and back to, I want to continue with the Soviet uh, assistance. That was uh, a big project over a two-year period. In the late 1950s, uh, the leadership in Hanoi asked the Soviet Union for assistance in this area. The, the State Security Committee, the KGB, supplied a lot of equipment and training over a two-year period. This project was called Vostok in Russian, which means East, and Phong Dong in Vietnamese. And it, it was very successful by all accounts. And our uh, primary, one of the main sources for this, Pribinau, um, emphasized this, that it was a big project. Uh, Merle Pribinau uh, has written about the relationship between Vietnam and the Soviet, uh, between Vietnam and uh, the Soviet Union, and, and especially, and less about the relation with China, and uh, he, he discusses that there was some tension and mistrust in both the Vietnam-USSR and the Vietnam-China alliance, and for this reason, or partly for this reason, in cryptography, the Vietnamese also used their own ideas and materials. He said that they were not dependent on the Soviets or Chinese, and this actually created problems for the NSA and the cryptographic branches of the U.S. Armed Forces because, of course, they had for many years been uh, analyzing and studying Soviet and Chinese cryptography. And when the Vietnamese carefully sort of tweaked it, uh, this made life more difficult for the cryptanalysts uh, on the other side. Also, another thing he's, he says is that uh, the Vietnamese tended to upgrade their implementation rather frequently, and this also created problems for the NSA. This is his report, uh, Soviet-Vietnamese Intelligence Relationship During the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War is, is the, U the American term for the American War in Vietnam. Uh, the subtitle is Cooperation and Conflict. Okay, so let me go on to the American War. Uh, when you study a historical question of cryptography, it's natural to separate offense and defense. So. Uh, from the standpoint of, um, of offense, were the Vietnamese able to intercept and read U.S. messages? Or, and on the other hand, from defense, were the Vietnamese able to send their own encrypted messages securely? Now, for encrypted strategic communications by the U.S., it's likely that the answer to the first question is no. They were not able to read U.S. messages for two reasons. The first reason is the NSA's high estimation of the cryptographic level of the North of the North Vietnamese government and the National Liberation Front in the South. And this would have caused the NSA to instruct the U.S. military that it must use a high level of communication security. Another source that confirms this is Brian Snow, who, who's a retired NSA official. He started to work at the NSA still during the war, the American War in Vietnam, and he rose to be technical director of the NSA's Information Assurance Directorate. Uh, I asked him when I was preparing, uh, when I was doing research on this subject, I asked him whether during uh, the American War in Vietnam, the NSA might have assumed that the Vietnamese were technologically primitive and so the U.S. military would not need state-of-the-art encryption devices. Now, he can't talk about specifics, but basically he said no. He said his division of NSA always assumed worst-case analysis and would ins insist that the U.S. military use the most advanced cryptographic protection in, in Vietnam. Uh, so that's the first reason to doubt that Vietnam broke enemy codes, that it would have been technically very difficult to do so. And, uh, but that's really just one side of the story. Brian Snow is a very good source. He's a person of great integrity. 
Uh, and I think what he was saying was basically correct as far as it goes. However, there is another side of this. And the other side is actually revealed in some of the declassified history by the NSA, which is that in battlefield communication, U.S. communications were generally either unencrypted or were formally encoded using military jargon and slang and ad hoc word substitutions and phrase substitutions and that sort of thing. Now the reason for this is that this wonderful uh, voice encryption device that the NSA supplied to the U.S. military in 1965 called the Nestor a device worked badly in the battlefield conditions in Vietnam. In the southern provinces of Vietnam, uh, it's hot and humid most of the time, and the, the devices were well designed, formally speaking. I mean, you could prove their security, but they, uh, uh, out in deployment, they were not, they could not withstand, I, I'm sure they could uh, withstand the weather conditions in Langley, Virginia, but they could not withstand the weather conditions in the south of Vietnam. Here's a picture of it. Now, many in the U.S. military believe that, they were sort of smug about this, they believe that the Vietnamese would never be able to understand American jargon and slang and informal uh, code substitutions in real time. However, in reality, it's, it became known that the NLF was, the National Liberation Front was often able to uh, exploit insecure tactical communications by the U.S. There's a, a, a very interesting book about this by Lieutenant General Charles Meyer that appeared in 1982. He talks about a raid on a Liberation Forces installation in December 1969 that resulted in capturing 12 uh, guerrilla fighters and large quantities of documents and communication equipment. And this was thoroughly analyzed by U.S. intelligence. They analyzed the equipment and tortured the, well, he used the word interrogate. They interrogated the prisoners. Uh, the U.S. learned that with, with their equipment, they also had English linguists, by, by which he means uh, Vietnamese working for the liberation forces who had extensively studied American English slang and jargon and American military slang. And with the help of those English linguists who were an integral part of Vietnamese units, they could, quote, monitor and exploit virtually all non-secure voice and manual Morse code communication. Captured documents, according to Meyer, contain extensive instructions on proper intercept techniques and detailed analyses of the communications procedures and exploitable weaknesses of U.S. and allied units. The commander of all U.S. forces in Vietnam, General Creighton Abrams, was briefed on this and, and concluded, and you see a certain sort of grudging respect for the enemy here. This work is really rather startling. The attention to detail, complete accuracy, and thorough professionalism is amazing. And then he gave orders that U.S. forces must improve their communication security. Well, despite his orders, U.S. troops were continued to be resistant to doing that because of the uh, practical difficulties of using cryptographic equipment in the field. General Meyer concludes that Although on the one hand, all users of communication facilities were more or less aware of their vulnerability to intercept by the National Liberation Front analysis and decoding, and of the need for authentication and encryption, but the gap between this knowledge and actual practice was immense, and in Vietnam it seemed at times an insurmountable problem. He tells of numerous instances on the record of the NLF sending false messages. So in one case, the Liberation Front tapped the internal uh, American telephone lines of a U.S. defensive base and diverted American reserve forces from the area where the National Liberation Front was going to attack by sending false messages. So this is a good explanation of the importance of authentication. Okay. Now here's an interesting case that Meyer tells about. A U.S. Uh, operator removed the cover of a KY-8 model Nestor device to allow ventilation and cooling. And this made sense because overheating was the biggest problem they had. However, that, that improved the operation, but it violated security by exposing the equipment to view and giving the enemy an opportunity to intercept intelligible signals. In other words, a successful side channel attack. And this I find amazing. You know, just 
uh, visualize in your mind's eye a half century ago, hidden deep in the hot and humid jungles of southern Vietnam, a signals intelligence unit of the National Liberation Force, of the National Liberation Front, is successfully exploiting side channel vulnerability of an NSA encryption device. And then uh, listening in to uh, top secret US military communication. And I, I think this is just really cool, you know, to think back that that was, that they did this. Okay, so, uh, so NSA also had a problem with side channel. Okay, now in contrast, the National Liberation Front probably did not break the high level encryption that was used for US strategic communication. I, there's a second reason to think that breaking strategic encryption was not done, and that's that the Vietnamese didn't have to do it. They had extremely good human intelligence sources. The most famous example of this is the master spy Pham Chuan An. And here's a, a photograph. He's on the right. On the left is the commanding general of all Vietnamese forces in that time, General Vo Nguyen Zap. He was inducted into the Vietnamese Communist Party, the Pham Chuan An was inducted into the Vietnamese Communist Party in 1953. Actually, he was inducted personally by Le Duc Tho, who uh, about 20 years later was offered the Nobel Peace Prize uh, along with Henry Kissinger. Um, Le Duc Tho refused the prize. Henry Kissinger should have refused the prize. But anyway, uh, so, n so no one less than Le Duc Tho uh, inducted him into the Communist Party, was ordered to refrain from any activities that would reveal his communist sympathies. He was sent to the United States in 1957 to study journalism, and, and then he went to Saigon as uh, a figure in the US news media during the crucial years of the war. He was trusted by top CIA people. He was very close to some, some leading CIA people in, in Saigon, as well as key officials of the South Vietnam regime. His career as a deep mole working for National Liberation Front and North Vietnamese intelligence lasted during the entire American war. And in secret, it later became known, actually quite recently, that he had received 16 medals for, upon his death, it, it was revealed, his death in 2006, it was revealed that he had received 16 medals for extraordinary s service in secret. There is, it is reported uh, from people from the Central Committee in, of the Communist Party in Vietnam that after receiving An's reports, General Vo Nguyen Zop and President Ho Chi Minh said, quote, now we are in the Americans' war room. In 1976, he was named Hero of the People's Armed Forces of Vietnam. He rose to the rank of Major General and was given a war hero's funeral when he died. There are two uh, nice readable books about his life in English. And they basically make the case that he was probably the most skillful and successful spy of the 20th century in any country. I also want to mention a mathematician who worked undercover in Saigon and also rose to the rank of major general, although in his case it was the police rank, uh, Professor Gwen Ding Gauk, who uh, when in his youth he, he studied math and several subjects of engineering in, Fran in France. He spent many years in France in his youth. But in the 1980s, when I met him, he was organizing seminars in algebra and topology and other things in Hanoi. Uh, he, he was a friend. He was actually a, a, a wonderful source of opinions and insights and information about what was happening in Vietnam in that time during my early visits to the country. Uh, during the American War, Gauk, who was fluent in English as well as French, he, he actually translated uh, the, the first public talk I gave in Vietnam, which was in 1983, uh, was translated from English into Vietnamese by Nguyen Dinh Gao, who was brilliant uh, at languages. Uh, during the war, he circulated in the foreign community in Saigon and acquired a lot of intelligence from them. He also had a brother who had a high rank in the South Vietnam military. Uh, but um, one thing uh, I don't know about Gao because during his lifetime, he, he never, of course, never mentioned to me anything about his activities during the war. One thing I don't know is whether he used his training in mathematics and engineering to help Vietnam, uh, to help the Vietnamese improve their cryptography. I don't know whether he played a role or not in the history of cryptography in Vietnam. And there were many others. 
perhaps Ahn and Gauck are among the best known, but there are many others. So the second reason for doubting that Vietnam broke U.S. strategic codes is very simple. With spies like these, who needs cryptanalysis? So, okay. However, with spies like these, they didn't want plain text messages from their spies captured and read. So uh, during, now during the year, 15 years when Pham Shuan An was sending secret information from top American and South Vietnamese sources, there were a total of 45 couriers used to, to bring his messages to the command. 27 were captured, tortured, and killed out of 45. So, and yet, Pham Chuan An himself, of course, was never discovered, was never discovered as the, seek, as the source of, of those messages. So that made me think at first that the Vietnamese must have used good encryption for his messages, right? Well, it turns out not really. And, and we have several sources. There's one thing that Hugh and I went to a lot of effort to try to get opinions on and get as much information as we could because it seemed like a contradiction. People were telling us, no, no, they weren't encrypted, and yet how could they have not been encrypted? Well, from what our sources, it seemed that typically what happened was the following. Uh, first of all, Pham Chuan An would write his reports in a type of rice starch and visible ink on paper and then wrap them around egg roll. He would then take them to the market where uh, a woman named Nguyen Thi Ba, who, who later became very famous after the war, in fact, her picture's in the Vietnam Women's Museum, uh, she was his first courier. In fact, she survived the war. She also lived, uh, was, was able successfully to continue her work as a spy during the entire 15-year period. So the first courier she, he gave it to was the woman in the market. And then, uh, this isn't quite, it's not that courier. She would then take it outside Saigon, and other couriers would take it farther to the Coochie Tunnels, not too far from Saigon, uh, where, uh, where Liberation Forces Intelligence had, had uh, a, a place there, and they would apply an iodine, an iodine alcohol solution to the invisible ink to make the report visible, and then they would recopy it, also in invisible, invisible ink, but dividing it in two parts. The shorter, most urgent, time-sensitive part, and, and the more general strategic analysis and the uh, part where Pham Chuan An could be quite wordy and quite uh, I go into a lot of detail. So the urgent part was sent by strongly encrypted radio link at a near, from a nearby uh, secret radio transmission station to NLF headquarters in Cambodia. The rest, the non-time sensitive part, was carried on foot to the Vietnamese leadership in Hanoi. Uh, one thing about those radio broadcasts into Cambodia um, that uh, I learned from Pribinau was that uh, the, what the Vietnamese did was they used words to stand for letters, very much like the military uses, the U.S. military uses Alpha Beta Charlie. Or there's now a popular movie out called Whisco, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. And the name of that movie, which at first might seem like a strange name for a movie, that's just the military way of saying WTF. I won't say what that stands for. Um, during uh, a long telephone call in February, uh, I asked, uh, Pribinau various questions. He told me about this, and he also confirmed that the NSA and the cryptographic branches of the Army, Navy, and Air Force never broke any of the high-level codes that the Vietnamese used for strategic communications. However, uh, Pribinau said that the tactical communications were either unencrypted or else weakly encrypted and easy for the NSA to break. So there's a, a big contrast here between the strategic and uh, tactical uh, situation, and that was already clear uh, in the case of Pham Chuan An's reports, that only uh, some, a short, only short part of his, of his report would be encrypted. Most of it was not. So the a question I was interested in was, why was U.S. intelligence unable to determine the source of An's unencrypted reports, given that uh, 27 of the couriers were captured. Now, one first question was, were they unaware that the NLF was sending messages in invisible ink? Here the answer is no. They knew that perfectly well. Uh, Pribinau said that uh, the CIA and even the French before them were very much aware uh, of the use of invisible ink by their opponents. 
Were the couriers able to destroy the messages quickly enough uh, on, the verge of capture, uh, on the verge of capture? Well, probably most of the time, or perhaps most of the time, but it's hard to believe that all 27 were able to successfully do that before they were captured. Um, another possibility that might be the most likely answer is that none of the captured reports had elements that pointed directly toward Pam Chuan An or gave clues to narrow the search. That is, the, the unencrypted messages might have been of a sufficiently general nature, you know, sort of gossip about what was going on in, in, in the, the U.S. and South Vietnamese um, high circles in Saigon and things of that sort, that there could have been a, a lot of possible sources. And in fact, US, U.S. intelligence knew that the South Vietnamese uh, military and intelligence services were riddled with spies. So it was hard to narrow down the source. And the part that was transmitted by radio to Cambodia was never broken by the U.S. So I I if that urgent part of the, of the message contained things that might have pointed to Pham Chuan An, that the U.S. was never able to determine. The, the source, by the way, Merle Pribonow, um, he retired from the CIA in 1995. He worked for 27 years as a Vietnamese language specialist uh, for the CIA. Um, and this was his summary of, uh, of, of Vietnamese cryptography uh, during this time. North Vietnam sent cryptographers and radio operators south in the early 1960s to upgrade the security of communications with the south. Said they used several different systems during the course of the war and upgraded their encryption systems several times. By the end of the war, at least, they were using a double encryption system involving the use of substitution codes from a code book and then enciphering uh, with a one-time pad out above that. Now, the, the cryptographic museum that Ban Ko Yo has displays such a code book and uh, the way it worked was that each syllable of a Vietnamese word was converted to a five-letter block in the Latin alphabet. And Vietnamese lends itself toward that because Vietnamese words break into s syllables that are written as separate words in, an, in, in a clear-cut way. So for example, attack, which is Tan Kong, uh, the first syllable was, was put in, in the code book that Hugh observed at this, uh, studied at this museum into AFHBV, basically random letters in, in, in the Latin alphabet, and the second syllable into five other ones. Then a one-time pad, which was shared just between two users, was, was used. Now, the, the code book that told how to convert Vietnamese word into the, the, the random five-letter blocks, that was shared among many users. That was distributed to many users. When a code book was captured by the US, um, it would be immediately replaced by another one. But that did not have the highest level of security. However, the one-time pad was just shared by two users. And it was manufactured as very, very tiny, presumably so that it could be swallowed if, if someone was captured. And it had to be printed in the Soviet Union because Vietnamese presses could not handle the printing job. And also, it had to be read with a magnifying glass, which is a tiny type. There's an NSA history called Spartans in Darkness, a nice title. Uh, and it's available online. It has some very interesting information, although the parts dealing with cryptography are heavily redacted. It uh, gives, to summarize the information in it, it, it gives two key areas where signals intelligence gave Americans tactical benefit. First of all, these are the two most important areas during the American war where, where the U.S. got an advantage. Starting in no late 1967, U.S. obtained accurate estimates for the numbers and the destinations of liberation forces that were moving south on the Ho Chi Minh Trail in preparation for the Tet Offensive of February 1968. And during the air war, uh, they could uh, intercept messages and alert U.S. bombers about surface to air missiles that were approaching and approaching MiGs so that they could take evasive action and break through the, the air defense around Hanoi and other key targets. Now, the problem for the Vietnamese was that encryption was very slow with, with the primitive technology. So tactical communication could not be sent securely if either a vast amount had to be sent, which was true in the period when personnel and materiel were moving south uh, in, in 1967, 68, or when information had to be sent extremely fast, as in the case of air defense. 
So those were, uh, so that was really the fundamental problem. So uh, Vietnam did manage to shoot down many bombers, but they would have shot down more if they'd been able to encrypt all of their orders to the uh, MiG pilots and the surface to air missile operators, which unfortunately was not possible. So this meant that during, during the time of the uh, Tet Offensive and also during the time of the air war, uh, American signals intelligence allowed the U.S. to inflict much greater casualties, mu mu much greater kill. The tremendous number of liberation fighters were killed during the Tet Offensive. It was a strategic victory for Vietnam, but it was a very, very costly one. Probably one of the reasons why it was so costly was because of U.S. SIGINT. And similarly, during the air war, the, the U.S. relied heavily on intercepting uh, surface-to-air missile communications, especially. So to summarize the, the picture, uh, despite the technological superiority of, of American forces, communication security was really approximately equivalent in the sense that it was good for strategic communications and bad for tactical communications on both sides. So in a sense, you can say that uh, crypto was leveling the playing field in the sense that Vietnam was fighting against a much more technologically advanced country but in cryptography, it sort of leveled off. So why was this? Well, I would say that, um, that uh, what, the point is that cryptography is like pure math. It's cerebral. You don't need capital investment in crypto. For good crypto, you have to be smart. You don't have to be rich. Uh, and uh, in Mathematics, Vietnam has a strong tradition, exemplified in the 20th century by professors Lee Von Kim and Huang Kui, pictured here, and in the 21st century by field medalist Professor Ngo Bao Chao. So uh, given that Vietnamese culture has places such a high value on things like pure math, places a very high value on pure thought, it's not really so surprising that they could come up with ciphertext that the NSA could not break. And Gosh uh, mentioned that among the anti-colonial wars in the 20th century, the, the, wars, the French War, for example, was, was unique in, in that respect. Okay, and finally, um, judging from last year's Asia Crypt, there's in, interest at Asia Crypt in the moral character of work in cryptography. Now, I'm not going to talk about that. I don't consider myself to be an expert on moral issues, and I think it's not always appropriate to lecture one's colleagues on what's moral and immoral anyway. So I won't do that. But what I do want to do is conclude my talk by talking about something uh, moral, uh, what I found to be an inspiring example of the highest level of moral behavior among people working in communications intelligence. So I want to tell that story. This is, was revealed in two sources. There's a book by a, a very famous American journalist named Seymour Hersh. The book's about N Kissinger and, and Nixon. It's not about anything related to cryptography, but there's a long footnote in it uh, that um, reveals the story. There's also a, a lot about this story, or a fair amount, in um, a declassified 2002 NSA history of cryptography in the war. Uh, although that's heavily redacted and there are only a few details added to Seymour Hersh's account. So here's what happened. During the U.S. Air Force Christmas bombing of Hanoi, December 1972, there was a large group of U.S. Air Force intercept operators at two intelligence stations, one in Udon, Thailand, the other in Okinawa, Japan. They conducted what was co what's called a nil herd protest over a 36-hour period. Nil herd in Air Force jargon means so you say, I can't hear anything. Nothing's coming through from the station that they're assigned to monitor. They, these men were so disgusted by the U.S. bombing, the war crimes that their government was committing, that they refused to report the intercepted traffic they were hearing from the Vietnamese surface-to-air missile station. This is pretty incredible. I knew, I'd, I was amazed at this. According to Seymour Hersh, some of the men were so disgusted by what their country was doing that they cheered when they hear, heard that a B-52 bomber had been shot down by the Vietnamese. 
Uh, there were reports. Now, the U.S. Air Force continues to classify everything connected to this episode. But there were rumors or reports from other uh, airmen that there were secret military trials of the protesters in Taiwan. Now, the action of these men who were low-ranking uh, U.S. Air Force men, they helped the surface-to-air missile stations defend Hanoi. And when I read about this, it brought back some vivid memories of the first trip to Vietnam by uh, Ann and me in 1978, just three years after the American War ended. It was a, still, you could see the devastation from the war. In fact, Noi Bai Airport, where, where we all landed, the international airport, at that time it was just a little airstrip. And around it, you could still see the bomb craters that were at that time filled with water. And when we drove in to town, you could see the trees had, had white paint around them, a strip of white paint. And we asked, what, why the white paint? The reason was so that uh, the moonlight reflecting off the white paint could guide the trucks because the trucks couldn't use light because it would reveal their location to the enemy who was, uh, who was uh, attacking from the air. So uh, just thinking about this, we, we also uh, went to Ham Tien Street. Now, Ham Tien Street is toward the center of Hanoi. It's a, about five kilometers from here to the south. Um, and now, of course, long ago, it was completely rebuilt. When we went, I don't know if it's still there, but in 1978, there was an exhibit uh, that showed the total destruction of homes on Ham Tien Street as a result of the Christmas bombing. On, just on that street alone, 283 civilians died on the day after Christmas in 1972. One of many, many horrible atrocities committed at that time. And here's a picture uh, taken soon after. You can see what uh, General Curtis LeMay meant by bombing them back to the Stone Age, right? Okay, now, of course, many of the bombers got through uh, despite the, the Vietnamese air defense. Many people were killed. But I would it's reasonable to assume that the protest action by the U.S. Air Force officers that uh, resulted in more planes being shot down, more bl bombers being shot down, must have prevented the number of people killed in Hanoi from being even greater than it was. And, and think about this. Those uh, signals intelligence workers in the Air Force, U.S. Air Force, faced an incredibly difficult moral choice. Either help save their, pil their pilots from the surface-to-air missiles or help defend the innocent people of Hanoi from the bombs. They chose the second. So now we're meeting in the same city 44 years later. I think we should pause to salute the, those men for their courage and morality at a time when war crimes were being committed against innocent civilians. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, for the fascinating survey. Uh, are there any questions or comments? <coughs> One of the most uh, famous incidents uh, in the American war was the attempted rescue of prisoners of war by the Americans. They raided uh, a camp where they thought that the prisoners of war were located, but it had been emptied before the raid. Do you have any indication that uh, cryptography or cryptanalysis played any role in this uh, failed attempt?
it was not due to the Vietnamese breaking American codes that they evacuated the camp. for the um, uh, broadcasted intelligence for the strategic stuff, was it the case that they would transmit from locations in, in the south or in the north to Cambodia, and then they had uh, effectively location anonymity for receiving? I mean, how, did, how was it actually organized in terms of sending messages? With, cur with couriers, it's clearly one person going to another person, but with the radio transmissions when they're encrypted, did they move locations before broadcasting or? Well, I would assume that the broadcasters must have moved, m must have been mobile broadcast units. Um, they couldn't have possibly stayed in the same place because that can be easily traced by the enemy. Um, in Cambodia, I think they were relatively stable. It, it was uh, until the U.S. invasion of Cambodia uh, later on, um, they had essentially sanctuary in Cambodia. So I think they had a relatively stable location there, but I d I'm not sure. I remember last year when we uh, had a conversation on this subject, you asked yourself a question to, um, uh, as to how the Vietnamese uh, intelligence uh, realized, I mean, uh, oh, be aware when the uh, message in the seat was by the American side. Would you have a question for that question now, uh, answer for that question now, or is it unknown? whether the Vietnamese intelligence was aware that when the Americans had, had broken the code. The code. Well, uh, as I said, the high-level codes were not broken, but, but uh, apparently they, they usually were able to figure out when the code books were, were captured. That was the main thing they had to worry about because the code books was uh, – would be one step, you know, if they could capture the code books and then they had couriers, they could capture the one time pad. Uh, so uh, that must have, they, they must have been able to get reports on that usually and quickly uh, issue new code books. But as far as breaking strongly encrypted Vietnamese messages, that just didn't happen. Um, but I'm not sure about how they would go about being sure to get to replace the code books quickly. I did have a series of questions that I, I, I prepared for people from Ban Ko Yo uh, last year and, and got some answers. Um, but uh, uh, and, and the answers that I did get from them and from other sources are incorporated here. But I didn't get answered to all possible questions. Um, in, in the liberation struggle in South Africa, the USSR also uh, had uh, helped a little bit with the math using uh, modular addition. Essentially, they did one-time pads. Um, and what they constructed were little teeny booklets that had an explosive residue around them so they could light them on fire and like, explode them before they were captured by the South Africans. And you said that it was very small in this case, and they used magnifying glasses. I wonder if you... Um, one, know where in the USSR they were produced, and maybe if the USSR made copies. And, and two, if they also used some kind of self-destruction mechanism, or if you got to see them. Well, that's a good thought. I, I didn't get any information that would indicate that. I assumed that, that they would swallow them, but uh, uh, there's nothing in any source that I saw that indicated they had a, a self-destruction mechanism. But again, that doesn't mean that there wasn't. I just didn't discover that. And uh, yeah, uh, I, and I don't know where in the Soviet Union they were printed. It, it was just uh, a technical thing. You know, the Vietnamese just simply couldn't couldn't do it. It wasn't that. Other than just having better printing presses or more um, uh, miniaturized printing presses, 
in, in the Soviet Union. There wasn't any other reason why it was sent to the Soviet Union to be printed up. Uh, just a political question. If there is a war now, do you think that Vietnamese would be able to match? Pardon? The if there was a war now, do you think that Vietnamese would be able to match <laughs> <laughs> on cryptographic <laughs> level? Well, I, I think we've seen that. I mean, my own opinion is that people often overestimate the capability of big, powerful enemies, like especially the U.S. Um, I think one of the lessons to me of the uh, Edward Snowden revelations, in fact, when I talked to Brian Snow sh soon after that, the first question I asked him was, wasn't he surprised that this was even technologically possible to study? to steal 1.7 million top secret documents from the NSA. He said he was absolutely stunned. He was just stunned by it. And I think the most surprising thing about the, the Snowden revelations is that it was possible. Just imagine the level of incompetence of an intelligence agency for it to be possible for a consultant from outside the agency to just walk away with that number of secret documents. And that fact, I think, should be encouraging to people in other parts of the world, uh, not to be too intimidated or, or not to overestimate um, the power of the NSA or anybody else. And I think this the story, you know, the NSA builds this uh, Nestor encryption device. It's wonderful cryptographically. It has all the necessary functionality. wasn't broken. But it, it, it just uh, mechanically the, it w was not suitable for the climate in Vietnam. And that resulted in side channel attack. So, when you hear these stories, I think it makes one a little bit more confident that the NSA or, or, or similar organizations in other countries are not um, impossibly strong adversaries. That we can have confidence that even a relatively poor country or uh, a country that doesn't have the infrastructure that the U.S. has can uh, be competitive in many areas, even of military technology. Other questions, comments? Please, we are none. Left hand speaker for, again for the wonderful talk.